Well, good evening, everybody. It's time for Wednesday night. I just ask you to come and find you a good place to sit. We're going to dive into Word of God. Seven o'clock, tick-tock, all right? So we're glad to have our friends and family at home watching with us as well. So again, it's Wednesday night. We're going to dive back in um, into our study of heroes that point to the hero. So we jumped on uh, the topic of Abraham last week. We're going to bring him along, but we've got some friends that are going to come with him, and we're going to see a little bit of them tonight as well. We're going to look at four questions specifically because there's some real talk here, and God's got a sense of humor. Can I just, y'all ever notice that? It's like you're in the middle of whatever you're in the middle of, and God just says, you know, and there it is right in front of you, and that's me with this, and I'm sure we can all relate to these different things, Um, but here's what I'm learning. So... Y'all help me with this, and some of you are not going to be as, you're going to be a little bashful, but I'm just curious. So what is the most important response we can give when it comes to our relationship with God? Think about it for a moment. What's the most important response? Worship. Worship is very critical, and I'm 100% behind worship, but it's actually not the answer I'm looking for because it's actually, it's actually a precursor. Now, I'm not going to mention on camera the guy that's laughing at you. I just want to know if he's got the guts to speak up right now, too, instead of laughing at you. But anyway, prayer is awesome. Look, sister figured it out because she looked at the notes and she said obedience. So obedience is the word. Miss Connie gets the prize. Philip Treasure, you can hook her up later, okay? So here's the deal, okay? Obedience leads to worship, so I set you guys up. Obedience definitely responds. So all the things we mentioned, like worship, service, are all responses through our obedience. I know, it's kind of tricky. But at the end of the day, um, obedience is absolutely a fundamental principle in in the Christian life. Um, And so it's what really led to the faith walk that we see in Abraham. You see, every which way, the answer was obedience obedience. And it's like, man, this guy is good because I'm not that good. I'm going to start getting into dialogue. And the responsiveness that he gives in the situations he's in is spot on. So I'd like for you to stand with me, please, for the reading of God's word, if you're able. And we're going to look in Hebrews 11, verse 11. We're going to jump down through to verse 19, and then we'll kind of come back to it and take it a bit at a time, okay? So again, you're going to see a lot of the faith walk here through faith. Also, Sarah... So now we got Abraham's wife, herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. I love that statement. If you like the highlight, that's a good one right there. Um, Therefore sprang there even of one in him as good as dead, I love that phrase there, in context of their age, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith. So now we get the summary. We're kind of not just Abraham and Sarah, so this is where we get the entourage. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. That is phenomenal. And were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Goes back to that vertical horizontal thing we've been talking about. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly country. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure." Father God, thank you. Thank you for forbearance, for patience, for love. Thank you for coming alongside us, helping us see when we can't see, helping us know that you're near. 
So I lift up each and every one tonight that's here, that's watching, that's gleaning. Father, I pray from your precious word. May they be your words, surely not mine. Uh, that, that only goes so far, but your word is what endures and sustains and strengthens and gives hope. And so, Father, we, we look to you tonight. I pray, Father, that when we look to these circumstances in Abraham's life, we would learn and we'd grow stronger in our walk with you. For we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. So as we look to the Word of God, I'm going to look at four different things that came out of these circumstances. One is a backtrack. So last week we did verses 8 through 10, which I'm not going to redo. But if you remember, as we went through verses 8 through 10, Abraham is called uh, from Ur of the Chaldees. We had the little map. And he's going to a place he's never been. So the first thing I want you to see is obedience when we don't know where God is leading. Obedience when we don't know where God's leading. And I've already really peppered the gumbo on that one, so there's no point in kicking that one back up. But that one basically sets the stage for the others. Because Abraham had such an incredible faith that even though he didn't always know what God was up to, and you're going to see this throughout every scenario, he trusted him, and he lived in obedience to him. So when we say obey, what do you think of? Anybody got a word that jumps off the page to you? Obey? Is that, does that have anything to do with rebuttal? Disagree? None of those words come to mind, right? Typical answers on our part usually, right? What, what do we mean by obey? Submission? Say it again. Submit? Surrender? Listen, follow. Um, I mean, all these come into play. And, and, and you need to capture that because there's a nature, it's called the flesh, we all have it, and it's not, it's not okay, but it's okay. That's why God gives us a spirit nature that we need to listen to instead of the flesh. But the, spirit, the flesh is always going to bark and say, come on, you don't want to do it that way. You got your own way. You know what's best. And you're going to have all these things that want to go against the grain of obedience, that's who we are in our flesh. Uh, but we walk in the spirit. We don't walk in the flesh. So we need to remember, and we see the godly principles in a man like Abraham. So we see, first of all, obedience when we don't know where God is leading. We did that last week. If you haven't seen it or forgotten, you can always go back on the live feed streams and such on the channels, and you can uh, catch yourself up on that. That was a great study we did last week. Second thing I want you to see is obedience, verses 11 and 12, when we don't know how God's plans will be accomplished. Uh, what's amazing when you read verses 11 and 12 in our text, and, and you see basically, all right, here's the reality. Can we cut to the chase? Okay. She's 89. He's 99. Nobody's supposed to be having kids at 89 and 99, right? Have we, do we get that understood? Okay, that's what, and even in biblical times, that would be on childbearing days. And, and in the, to the point where I subscribe to Paul, you can subscribe to whoever you want as far as we don't have a direct 100% uh, certainty as to who wrote Hebrews, I lean towards Paul. I like, I like the editorial. I, I love the fact that he just basically said, yeah, they're pretty much good as dead. Ain't, no, ain't nobody supposed to be having no kids at this age in our vernacular today, the way we would say it. And <laughs> he just says, how in the world are we going to do this? Natural response, right? God, I'm going to be obedient. You said it. So this is where I want you to see, through faith also, so in addition to Abraham, Sarah herself received strength, okay? How are we going to do this, God? It's not supposed to work this way. So you can read the backstory in Genesis 17 and 18. We're not going to have the time to do all that tonight, but that's where this story comes from. And at some point in that conversation, not only does Sarah laugh, but Abraham laughs. And by the way, before you throw rocks, wouldn't you? Wait, God, how? What? <laughs> um, you understand, uh, that was about 30 years ago. Them days are long, 40, 50 years ago. Them days long gone, man. And God says, good, now we got this established. Let me show you who's boss. And God can only do what God does. And again, he shows. Um, so <laughs> the perplexity, the challenges, but the fuel for the fire, hold your spot here and I, I had to post this the other day because, man, there was some shouting going on at 5.30 in the morning. I mean, I, 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 don't, I like the coffee, and that helps. 
But man, it's like I got me a double shot or triple shot when I got to this one. In Genesis chapter 18, I, I wasn't going to read it all, but I want to read you what he, what's said here. And Sarah laughs, verse 13, and he says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? So I want to ask you a question. Do you think that's limited to the Sarah Abraham conversation? Does that pertain to today? Y'all with me? You think God can still do what he wants to do? So is anything still too hard for God? Now, it depends on what kind of day we're having. But most of the time, we probably question this a little bit. We may not laugh like Sarah. We may cry. <laughs> we may yell. And we may laugh. <laughs> really? Is, uh, what are we going through now? You know, and we kind of, you know, God just looks and says, okay, go ahead and do whatever you're going to do. And let me just remind you, is anything too hard for God? That's some fuel right there for you. I mean, that just gets you going. And it reminds you where you are in the grip of God's grace, in the grip of God's power. So she, I love the passage where it says, because she judged him faithful. That's obedience. She, she took into account who he is. She stepped back from the situation. But that's some good wisdom right there, by the way, because if you're not careful, you'll get caught up in the moments of life. How are you going to do this one, God? He's God. He can do whatever he wants. If the questions start permeating our mind, the doubts, because we listen to the wrong voices and we listen to the devil, and we don't step into that obedience. Um, instead, and I, and I love this, oh, unbelief says, how can this be? I mean, how's this going to happen? That's unbelief. Obedience says, let it be. Um, remember the story of Mary when she was told that she would bear a child even though she was still a virgin? She's like, how can this be? And then the angel proceeds, and she says, so let it be. That's Luke 1, 34, and then 37 and 38, if you're taking notes. She says, so let it be. Well, how can you say that? Because she's an obedient faith. She sur submits, surrenders, those kind of concept of the word, and she trusts and takes God at his word. And she says, God, I know it doesn't make sense, but you're God, and you're not worried about human rationale. You're God, and you're supernatural, and you supersede our rationale. So we see, we don't know where God is leading. Okay, we let that establish. Obedience, when we don't know how God's plans will be accomplished. Okay, so thirdly, we also want to look at obedience when we don't know when God's promises will be fulfilled. I am laughing at myself, y'all, because I hate when I got to preach to myself. <laughs> But anyway, can we just review verse 13? If nothing else, humor the preacher, because I need this tonight. These all died in the faith. Well, that's a bummer. They didn't get the, you know, it's kind of like you had all these plans and you didn't get to see it happen. What's the point? Because they believed it and they trusted it and they died in their faith in the mindset that they were to the point where they had a greater vision because they considered themselves strangers in a strange land. It wasn't theirs. They knew where their heavenly hope was. And they never truly uh, took root here because they knew their eyes were fixed on Christ. These all died in the faith. All these godly heroes died believing and trusting God. They were obedient to him and his promises. Even though the Bible says they were afar off. Translation, they were unfulfilled still. Sometimes we see things and we're like, when are we going to get to this? When are we going to get to this? You know, maybe, maybe you're waiting on something happening and the spouse kind of elbows you a couple times. Well, when are we going to get this done? You know, we've had this, the honeydew list, as we call them sometimes, and, and, and all those things that go with it. And, and he says, hang in there. And so it's, it's, it's important to remember the, the things that are being said here. Um, and so he died believing God and his promises, even though they were afar off. So there's a song that's been kicking in my head. You know, sometimes you get a playlist song and it's just kind of stuck in your head. And some of you may know the song, My Testimony. It's kind of the thing that's going through me right now. It's a, as the kids call my jam and that's my jam right now. The song has the refrain in there. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Some of y'all know the song. Matt, are you smiling? You with me? So this is, this is truth. And it's just been pouring into me. If, I, if, if I'm not dead, God's not done. In other words, we're still got things to do. So even though life may not be 
I may never see the fulfillment of some things that I'd hope for in Christ, but it's okay because God knows what he's doing. He doesn't need Pete. He uses Pete, but he doesn't need Pete at the end because God's going to do what he does. And he just brings us along and he brings us along. And one day he's going to rapture us out and it's all going to be good. And if I die before the rapture, praise God. And if I go in the rapture, praise God. It's all good because God's God. And that's why we have to trust him. So we're obedient, even though we don't know when God's promises are going to be fulfilled. I don't know. Do you know? No, I don't know. By the way, case in point, when does, does Jesus know when the rapture's happening? Jump, Jacob jumped on that quick. Good answer. Helps us only the Father. Now, you uh, doctrinal uh, serious scholars, you can figure that one out. That Jesus doesn't know, but God does, and they're three in one. I'm still figuring that one out. Um, but I don't have to. I just trust him at his word. But I just keep thinking about my testimony. Great things are still to come. <laughs> and God's got big plans. And I'm so blessed to be a part of it, and we all are, as we do life in Christ. May it be said of me and of you, like them, that we don't just die, but we die how? In the faith. What an epitaph, huh? You stand over and you're trying to reconcile. How'd they do life? Man, they did life in the faith. They weren't just of the faith. Of means you're kind of characterized, but in means, you know, you're waist deep and maybe up to here in it because this is what you do. And, and so this is what's testified in these scriptures there and, and up to uh, verse 16 there um, because it's critical that we remember uh, died in the faith. They were persuaded. They embraced. They confessed, as all mentioned there in, in, in verse 13, um, the, you know, you didn't have to coerce them much. They trusted God in obedience, and, and they didn't have to have the time clock for it. They just trusted God and walked with him accordingly. Again, not to be redundant, as I've already said in the beginning, but obedient faith will not merely be horizontal. It goes vertical. And you continue to look ahead, and you continue to look for God and see God in the midst of it all and trust him in the process of everything we're trying to do here. So this can become a huge roadblock if we're not careful because we can get so fixated on what's here that we don't see him in the midst of it. Abraham, Sarah, even though, hey, you're going to have kids. Hey, how are you going to do this? And what's this going to be? And when's this going to be? Verse 14, verse 16 shows them looking forward. Did you see that? Um, the Bible says, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, not here. They go, they go beyond. Uh, verse 16, but now they desire a better country that is heavenly. So they see beyond what we often get stuck on. Um, and, and, uh, and verse 15 captures something here. Let me park this for a moment. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. So this is the mindset. We look forward. We don't go back. The past is a beautiful thing, but it's a brutal thing at the same time, depending on how you view it. We all have a past. Sometimes our guilt, our shame, will try to imprison us because of our past. And if you come to Christ and you sought forgiveness, it's an east to west principle. The Bible declares it very plainly. It's gone. So it's the old song, what sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. I mean, it's, it's gone. And the devil says, but remember, and God, God's telling you, I don't. And I know we, we say, well, God knows everything, but in the economy of forgiveness and grace, he forgives and he moves on, and we move on. So we don't look back on where we were because that's a trap in a lot of ways. Now, we learn from our mistakes, yes, and we're proud of where we've come from in the same way through Christ and, and obedience, but we can't stay there. Um, I, I, you know, the back to Egypt committee doesn't work in the economy of God. Understand that now. There's a lot of people that want to go back. Let's go back. Lot's wife, what you want to do? Go back. Doesn't work. You cannot live in the past. I, I can't effectively pastor this church if we're going to keep going in the past. We embrace where we've come from, but we go forward. I can't do what I used to when I was 25. I was watching with my son the other night. I don't watch much basketball anymore. And we had a game on. He and Abigail were at the house. Cameron was. 
And he said, Dad, the Lakers are on. And I, I just, I don't really care for the individual, but you have to respect a man that's nearly 40 and can play basketball like LeBron James does. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Uh, he'd probably like to go to his past, as we all would, and recharge our uh, batteries, if you will, to be the guy we were or the gal we were in our 20s and 30s and have that zip. But, but you know, most of us would love to go back, but we can't. So we go forward and we press on and we don't go back. And that was a warning to them not to go back. So we don't know when God's promises will be fulfilled, but we trust them anyway. Lastly, obedience. When we don't know why, God. <laughs> this is the story that I'd love for you to really, and I don't. I'm not going to be able to do it long term. But verses 17 through 19, let's just revisit it. I've already read it. By faith, Abraham. Woo, you want to talk about a by faith moment? Try this one sometime. When he was tried, offered up Isaac. <laughs> All the trouble he went through to have this child only to be at an altar with the knife. The kid even looks at him and says, Dad, <laughs> we've got this, we, but where's the, where's the lamb, you know? Where's the offering? And you remember his response, the Lord will provide. And um, Anyway. You have to read that for yourself. But by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Do you know, when you read that, it's what it says. I love it when the, or Johnny, when those commentators try to really step into that like they were there. Well, did he really take that? He said he offered him up. That means he was there. He was tired. He was going to do it. There was, there's, don't read some of the foolishness of some of these guys that try to rationalize and philosophize on it. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. The Bible says it to the point where he went beyond imagination because he, this is how much he trusted God. I love this here. How many resurrections have happened in Abraham's day, huh? We don't have the cross yet, y'all. This is way, way before the cross. But we see the image of this and one willing to offer up their son as a sacrifice. That's why the Bible used the word figure in the context. He was willing to let it go just the way God eventually would offer up his son. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave, same principle. Abraham, the only thing he didn't do was plunge the knife. He got ready to, hold up Abraham, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be. I mean, it, it, this doesn't make sense. Everything's bound in Isaac. There was a rationale at one time about Ishmael and how is this going to work out? And God told him it's not going to be through Ishmael. You could give me all these things, Abraham, but it's going to be through Isaac. So he trusts God and he goes through all the links and everything else to get to this point. And then God says, go up there and we're going to sacrifice him. And what does he do? Walks in obedience. That's impressive. <laughs> I'd like to tell you that I'm not spiritual, and I'm going to tell you I'm not. I'm not going to lie to you. And if you say you are, you, I'll sit down, because be honest with you, that's, that's a tough pill to swallow. Well, if it means giving up my kids, so be it. Um, not just any kid. This is the only begotten here. I mean, they're not having any more kids. I mean, they've already passed the miracle stage. I mean, God can do whatever he wants, but they he proved the miracle in the childbirth. Did he? So here's the question. This is the... But Johnny always asks these questions in his class. Did Abraham know that God was going to work it out? Well, it says it there. Uh, did he have plan B? Well, if we get rid of Isaac, we just have another kid. That wasn't what he was thinking. That, it wasn't even that he had to rationalize God. He trusted God to the point that even though he had no concept, see it here. Don't, don't take my word for it. This was what blows my mind. Verse 19. Accounting. Bill, if you like that word? <laughs> it's what it means. He, 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 he put it in the bank. Bank on it. That God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. This is the picture of Christ. Verse 19 is phenomenal. It's gold. God can do whatever he wants, y'all. You and I don't have to figure it out. Here's the thing. You and I don't have to sit down and try to get the equation right and 
How's this work supernatural? You, you, can, you and I can do this. We can go to the halls of all the seminaries and let's get out of all the great minds and, let's, and it doesn't matter. And it's really not going to come to any conclusion because it's not stated there. Here's what Abraham did. Abraham said, that's my God. I trust him. I'm going to be obedient. Wow. Think about that the next time you're trying to write a check that you don't know if you're going to be able to deposit or cash. Think about that when you're not sure what this looks like on the other side because you have no idea where you're going or what you're doing, but God said, God said, and I don't know anything else to do but be obedient. Think about that when you try to sit down and, and, and pull out the books and the rulers and the measurements and God says, what are we doing here? I said it, let's go. And the great thing, and, and it, I'm going to conclude because there is no dialogue. There is no, well, Isaac had a hair, or God, God or Abraham had a hair, and they had a little debate. It even says that dad and son had a little conversation. I, Isaac asked a question, Abraham gave him an answer, and they just kept on. I'm concluding that if there was a further dialogue that you and I could glean from here, we'd have had it. It's not here. I mean, it's, Dylan, it's just like you and dad back in the day. Daddy said it. You just went and did it. You didn't have no questions about it, right? Such a good young man you raised there. No smirks and laughs at all. Um, here's the reality. This isn't normal. It's definitely not 2024. You know, we got to get the panel out and let's debate about whether God and whether we should be or shouldn't be obedient. Let's get all the scholars over here and all the liberals over here and have a healthy conversation. Who gives a rip? God just showed us how it's supposed to be. What's the old saying? God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And really, you could cut out the middle if you really want to, but you should, obe you should obediently believe it. But it settles it. Such incredible faith. So, Abraham was tried. His faith was on trial. That's what the Bible says there. The natural response is, why God? <laughs> oh, this is where instead of why God, it becomes why not God. It's not like God, you can't do this. I mean, I shouldn't have had this kid to begin with. You can do whatever you want. You can show yourself in such a way. And here we are thousands of years later still telling this phenomenal story. And it's still just as riveting. It's still as gut-wrenching because, you know, you have people in your life, kiddos, or maybe special people in your life that you would just struggle with that concept. It would break you. If I will give any uh, some uh, speculation, I don't think for a moment that Abraham was unsympathetic. But I don't think he surrendered to his sympathy. How many times do we give in to our sympathy? I know God, but <laughs> I've done it, you've done it. There's no debate. I'm sure he's like, I'm not, you think Abraham was looking forward to this? But he'd rather trust God than his feelings. Let that sink in. Because our feelings usually win at the end of the day, don't they? God, feelings, mm, it's so much easier to just feed our feelings. Nope. But God. Why God? No. <laughs> Why not God? Show yourself through me. Do what only you can do. Um, Abraham was so radical about his why not God faith that, he, again, he believed God would raise up Isaac when there's no such thing. <laughs> not at least in biblical comment so far that we know of. In Abraham's obedience, God provided the needed sacrifice. You can read about that in Genesis 22, right before. And there just happens to be this ram, such an irony. What a coincidence, right? Of course not. Doesn't our God always provide? At the perfect time, every time, there's God. And he does it in so many wonderful ways. And again, we see the figure in the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God. I'm going to keep it closed tonight. I'm not going to get too big. All I know is this. We're going to come to those crossroads in life. The where's, the how's, the when's, and the why's. And you're going to have to make decisions. And I'm going to tell you, the road that leads to obedience is always, it's the road that got you there to begin with, so keep walking it and stay on the right path. Because if you follow the path of feelings and, 
and, and, and um, free thinking and all the other things that the world tries to pour into you and be your own whatever, uh, you're going to find that that's not the path you want to be on. So I want to ask a question tonight. Do you trust God? I thought I did a lot more but until I read this. And then I got wondering, do I really trust God with everything? Um, boy, I had a random thought. Austin, I am going, you weren't even around, man. What year were you born? Yeah, you might have been barely kicking. I got an old song that's like spinning through my head right now. Um, Twilight of Paris, Do I Trust You, Lord? I don't know if any of y'all know the song or not. Really powerful. I don't know why it's in my head right now, but that, that trust factor. No. <laughs> you want to talk about going south in a hurry, that's where it goes south. But it's the struggle in the song. It talks about how we struggle. Anybody know that song besides me tonight? Anybody? I'm the only one. You ought to go look it up sometimes. It's a beautiful song. And it just, how we talks about those crossroads. Um, I think Lisa used to sing it years ago. Man, that's us. And God says, here's the better way. Because there's a better country. There's a better heavenly country. Why in the world would we want to go the other way? What's in that path? A lot of emptiness, a lot of disappointment. Mm. The obedient path, it's not easy. You know, wide, narrow, we've seen this throughout the Bible. But it's correct, it's God-honoring, it's so much more blessed. It's going to challenge you. Might rock your world every once in a while. But at the end of the day, you get to say that famous thing we all love saying at the end, right? Ain't God good? <laughs> and that's what he shows out so many ways. Tonight, I want to give you an opportunity if you want to make a decision to show your trust in the Lord. We're going to give you an opportunity if you want to come pray. I'm available to you. And I'd love to help you any way we can because God's word is worth taking him at. Trust him. Follow him. Honor him. Walk in obedience with him. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, right? I mean, the song is scripturally based. And maybe we, we can all glean from a little bit of that tonight. Let's stand. Brother Austin, what song, brother? 591. 591, we invite you to sing, pray, follow him in obedience tonight. Yeah.